TV. You're still watching Morning at 10 TV. I'm Arnold Sagawa. It's uh, just uh, 40, well, uh, something 43. My math is failing me. 17 minutes to uh, 8 a.m. Let's uh, shift gear, talk about uh, the upcoming uh, elections 2021. As we understand, we're going to be having uh, uh, scientific campaigns, quote unquote. And uh, to just uh, help us understand the dynamics, uh, some new constituencies coming up and about, uh, new parties, not so new, maybe. Uh, mergers happening, people jumping ship to help us uh, just unpack some of these things. I do have uh, two people just to my immediate left. Uh, Sarah Birete, who is a political analyst, and uh, to my extreme left, the gentleman with a beret. Uh, Joel Senyoni, who is a spokesperson for uh, the People Power Movement. Joel, did you feel like doing the introduction just just there? You know, you, you sliding in. Ah, no, please, uh, yeah. do, do your thing. You sure? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm happy on this other end. Yeah, you're happy on that side. I did that for, what, 14 years? Yeah, so okay. I'm, I'm happy where I am. <laughs> you're an old man, Joel. Yeah. Uh, not quite. Okay, okay. We, we started these things fairly early. Uh, How are you today? Not bad, not bad. How is it um, doing what you're doing? It, it's good. So huh? when I left, I'm told you that replaced me. Uh, no, no. I, I might uh, come back for my job. They, they, they said I had a better <laughs> voice. So so they, they insisted, you know, that we need someone with a great voice. Okay. So, so yeah, Good so they, they put me in the seat. Uh, Sarah, how, how's it going? No, we are fine. And uh, good morning, viewers. Mm. Uh, and uh, we thank NTV for the work that you continue to do as we navigate the political waters in this heated campaign season. Heated under COVID pandemic. Uh, heated campaign season that is not necessarily going to have uh, the traditional orthodox rallies that we are used to before. Um, shouldn't that really be an, uh, an opportunity not to be as heated as we thought? That's what everybody thought. But in the past few days, we have seen several arrests. Mm. Arrests of comedians, arrests of musicians for songs composed. Many years ago, we have seen the unveiling of 18 regulations by UCC that are meant to curtail the creative industry. And then the political development in several parties. Mm. I, I have Joel, whom I last met as a spokesperson of People Power. He has added other, <laughs> other mandates. Yeah, mandates and the FDC, the Lord Mayor. You know, okay. so many things happening. I, I think let's uh, start there. Um, Joel, so <coughs> if, if we're to uh, uh, touch on uh, some of the uh, amendments to the law, I think that would be a decent uh, place to start. Uh, do you get the sense that there's some sense of discomfort from maybe some... Amendments to which laws, specifically? Not, not laws per se, but mm. uh, some amendments that uh, she did allude to, um, some yeah. guidelines <coughs> that have been uh, put forward yeah. to actually... Yeah. Uh, 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 watch the media, watch the, uh, the, the comedian, well, the, the cultural space. Uh, do you get a sense that there's some discomfort coming from other uh, state apparatus? No, it's fear. It's fear. It's paranoia, really. Um, they, they're extremely afraid because reality has struck them. They have woken up and smelled the coffee. People that they used to disregard and denigrate, you know, these are just artists, they're inconsequential and all of that. They've come through and they're saying, look, we, we are Ugandans. First, we also want a good country. And so they're not, as has always been the case, just cracking jokes about sexuality and all these uh, ridiculous things. They're, they're talking about things that matter. They're talking about country. They're talking about pressing issues. Yes, in a comic way, but they're delivering the message home. And, and so the state is scared because people are waking up and, and they're part of what's going on. Um, Obviously, it is, it is illegal, if you ask me, because if I am a citizen and I use my platform to speak out, B because, you know, you know, when I was here, for example, <laughs> there was always this talk within government circles, is Joel an activist or a journalist? I said, look, I'm a Ugandan first, mm. and then a journalist, so if I have a platform, I'll speak out. I remember that time I was aggressively against the amendment of the Constitution to remove the presidential age limit. And I said, whenever I go on air, I'll make it very categoric, as Joel Senyoni, a citizen of this country, that I'm against this, okay? And some people took offense with that. I said, I'll keep on doing that because as a citizen, I'm concerned. It, it concerns me. So artists, through their music, 
it, it concerns them that they will not just sing about love, but they will sing about country, they will sing about injustice, uh, uh, they will talk to, about uh, inequality, and uh, they should be able to. Uh, if we were to uh, just uh, put a pause on that and uh, just go back to the, the part of the artists, mm -hmm. uh, as per today's Daily Monitor, I'm, I understand that uh, they've not been charged, uh, at least as per the five of them. Uh, doesn't that just defeat the same process of the rule of law if someone is detained for more than, well, close to what, four, five days, and they're not charged per se? And that's the problem, because, because they're not going to charge them for anything because they've not committed any offense, at least within our laws, mm. okay? And, and there's even precedence, so there's uh, something we were trying to charge them with, but then they looked at uh, some precedents, the Charles Nyangu Bo case and several others, and they literally, literally had nothing. So it's just to instill a bit of fear that if you're an artist, you're out there, you're a comedian, you know, if you speak about injustice, it is okay if you crack jokes about sexuality, if you sing songs just about love and so on, it's okay. But if you begin singing songs about injustice, if you begin talking about corruption in your songs or in your art or creativity, if you begin talking about inequality, mm. then we are going to come after you. So they're just trying really to, to instill fear in the others. I hope they'll not fall for that. Sir? Yeah, of, of course, the detention beyond 48 hours is illegal and unconstitutional. But does the police respect the Constitution? D does the regime respect the Constitution? I, I think that's where all this is pointing to. Article 29 is very clear on freedom of speech, association, and expression. And artists, like any other citizen in the world, cannot mm. be denied the mm. natural rights that they are born with and the only duty of the state is to regulate the enjoyment of rights but not prohibit the enjoyment of such rights. So when you see the arrests that have happened, the, uh, the so Bizonto comedy group, mm. Chuewa, the musician over that Nanta Basong, I think <coughs> he's still under detention. And they, the were, they were all released yesterday. They were all released, ah, just the five. Yeah. Very good. So, but if you look at that targeted it is, it is political persecution. It is a direct way police is clamping down on political dissent in this country. And, and it is unconstitutional, it is illegal, especially when we are in a season where 80% of political campaigns are going to be held using media. Uh, music is part of media. Media is broad, that's why music is regulated under the Media Council. So when you move to curtail any message that speaks about against the regime or what the regime wants to hear, you, you are clamping down on, 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 on people that would want change in this country, and it's their right, because that's why we have opposition candidates. M m as much as President Museven is unopposed, in NRM after blocking MP Simba from returning forms, there will be candidates in this country. There will be contestation. So we are in a political contestation. So right. I, I think police should restrain from <coughs> persecuting people who have divergent political views in this country. Right. Um, let's uh, touch on the issue of uh, the 31 constituencies that uh, were unveiled. Now, I think for me the timing is what I want to address here, Joel. Uh, the timing of these constituencies on, well, less than, what, uh, eight months to the election. Does this signal something to you, or uh, was it really in play from the get-go? The, the, the background to the political gerrymandering in this country <laughs> is the elaborate patronage system, really, by, by the political system. The political establishment looks at creation of jobs only through political seats. Even when they are talking, they say, for you, we created this post in your constituency. Why didn't you? You, know, ca you should have come and we discussed. So we know we have high unemployment rates. With the educated youth, the unemployment rate is 68%. And generally, for young people, the unemployment rate is 78%. And also, the highest paying, political jo the highest paying jobs in this country are political jobs. MPs are way above all professionals in this country. So it is lucrative business for the regime. And even when you look at constituencies that are divided, it's normally opposition-held constituencies. And this is a pattern that most people have not analyzed. If a district or a constituency is difficult for NIM to win, they normally go for it and divide it. We have very huge constituencies that are not yet divided because it is politically comfortable for NRM to win over in those constituencies. 
So if you see Nakawa, Nakawa is predominant in opposition, you see people power. I don't know whether Joel is a, a contestant there. So you try to see how do you create room for NRM maybe to win part of that constituency. Mm -hmm. But we have a political challenge that was filed by one quizera challenging the elections of in, in newly created municipalities. The Constitutional Court held that the procedures of creating those municipalities was wrong, and the elections in those municipalities should have waited for the next election. Yep. But the pattern has not just started yesterday, so the timing is, the, 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 the regime has been creating constituencies, even when the parliament <coughs> has already started, which is unconstitutional as per the Constitutional Court ruling. And the mandate to create constituents is, f is for electoral commission. But we never see electoral commission involvement in the creation of these districts. So everything is upside down. Uh, Joel, I saw you smile uh, <laughs> there well, at the mention of uh, the, the, the prospect of you running for uh, uh, office. Uh, is, is that something that uh, you, you want to share? I just share this with Sarah only. Don't show that man. This general is <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, are you showing us the khaki? Or <laughs> <laughs> no, not showing the khaki. I'm just showing IK holder ah, here. But anyway, khaki. aside from that. <laughs> is, is that you uh, running for office? So the point here is, and I build on to what Sarah is saying. So <laughs> when, when they realize, for example, <laughs> a certain area is a stronghold of opposition, they're thinking, mm, but now we have our man, our man in NRM. We must create some space for him, you know. Uh, so they imagine if we split Naka, for example, uh, Senyumi can remain one side. And then maybe we have some space created for Ruhimi. I'm not even too sure he will win that other side. Mm. Um, but, but also, the long and short for me is... Uh, Joel, you're, you're uh, as, a, as a former journalist, I, I have mm. to commend you on uh, uh, refusing to answer questions. W what was the question? The question was, are you running for any office per se? And all Ye you yes, I am. Party. I've um, uh, uh, made my intentions very clear, yeah. including on this very set. Right. Um, I am aspiring to become MP for Nakawa. Okay. They have split it now. You know, um, I was happy with the whole chunk. Nakawa has actually been the biggest constituency. One of the biggest, if not the biggest, constituency. Abban. Um, Abban <coughs> constituency. Yes. So, you know, one would say it's been long overdue for a split, but, but again, I'm not the kind who is for keep making every village a constituency, a district, and that kind of situation. So I was happy with the entire chunk. Uh, but now they've said, uh, ah, Senyu, you remain this side, don't disturb Aruhimbi and all of that. But you know, for me, the, the, the long and short is, the, the message we keep sending, and here I'm talking about government, is uh, the more administrative units you create, the closer the services come to you. No, that there's there's that nothing a as fallacious as, as that. Yeah, that's it's a complete fallacy. Because you see, look, so if this is a district, this table here, yeah. and then you say, uh, so we have one hospital, it is here, and so if you people there need a, a hospital, we must create a district. A district. And I'm then thinking, you wait have a minute. 90% of the budget <laughs> going into administration instead of building a hospital. This, well, there you are. So where is the logic? For no, me, I'm no, saying, on paper, if on they, paper. let me just finish this point, Arnold. So if the hospital is here, just create another hospital on the other side. What, will the hospital fail to come up just because you've not split this into a district? But, but Get the services there. Build the schools, build the hospitals. But let's cop, stop stop taking people for food. Well, and saying, paper, you see, when we create the uh, districts, services are going to come Joel, closer to Joel, you. Joel, on, on paper, the, the process of decentralization, on paper, mm. the process of decentralization would support that logic of if we split this up, this, uh, uh, the fiscus on this side will be separate from the fiscus on the other side, and in so doing, this other half of the table can motivate for having a hospital of their own, and the fiscus would then suggest that, you know, they have their own budget, and those guys also have their own, so splitting it in the middle would actually make sense. Now, that's on paper. Now, uh, th the biggest problem that we have in the country is just the process of uh, implementation. Now, these things are said, these things look good on paper, yes, but when it comes to the implementation is when we get to the point that she's saying, or even you, that uh, then that goes into administrative costs, 90% of them, instead of you know, setting up the hospital on the other side. So on paper, yes, the administration, the administrative uh, uh, perks of, of, of decentralization are there, yes. I actually don't agree that even on paper they look good, because me, I'm, I'm, I'm using logic here. Uh, yes, on paper, they'll say all these different things, you know, that uh, so... Let's create another district here such that people can get those. I mean, that's, that's the detail that they will give, such that services can get closer to you. So whether it be on paper or on ground, it, it's good that logic gets to apply. 
I'm, I'm trying to avoid common sense, but, but that applies too. Because common sense should show you that what the people want is services. Who says you cannot deliver those services you cannot without creating take a, a road. district? You cannot you know? construct that you can't a road. build a road. That we you can't build a you hospital. Need a district that you can't fast build a in school. Order to construct you, a you road. want to first put in place it another administrative unit. Fragrant. Because you see, that yeah. other administrative unit, it's it's going to actually suck a lot more money. And by the way, the logic again is by creating another district, the, the income does not increase, yeah? So it's 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 no guarantee that now you've created another district, somehow money is going to increase, that the other district is going to make a lot more money. No, no, no. Actually, what you're splitting is the already small cake. So for what, what some of us are saying is, if the issue is services, deliver those services for heaven's sake, okay? If the district is too big, it has just one hospital, create another hospital in the other part of the district, as opposed to splitting, and then the administrative costs, and then the hospital cannot come up after all, or the school, whatever the case might be. Services, 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 what, what people need. But you see, our politicians, you know, because really they get to benefit greatly out of this, so they will drive the narrative of, you see, we need now this district and so on. That's when you get a hospital. That's when you get a school. And, and, and again, I'll, I'll blame our people out there also many times. They clamor for these things. They've fallen for the trap of the politicians that you need a district for, you to, for your lives to get better. Where is that written? Logically, how does that make sense? It does not as far as I'm concerned. What the people want is services. You see, for as long as people can access health care, as long as their children can go to good schools, as long as they have good roads, they will actually have no reason to clamor for any district. But we have, we have inoculated it in them that you must have another district for these things to come. I, I just don't understand how we reason. Uh, so and maybe, yeah, to add on what Joel is saying, we have already a bloated administrative bill in this country. We have about 122 presidential advisors. Now the members of parliament are about to go to 600, and they even don't have where to sit. The, the, the size of parliament cannot accommodate the, the number of members of parliament that they are approving every day themselves. So even simple logic that even a young child can use to say, okay, we need more people here. But the ones you have already, it's like a family with children who have no beds or no space to sleep on, and you are busy producing and looking for triplets every day. So where are, they going to, where are you going to accommodate them? So the size of parliament alone cannot accommodate the number of MPs that, that, that are going to be there. Maybe we need to shift parliament to sit in Nambole Stadium. <laughs> because, <laughs> because really, <laughs> if the current ones have <laughs> nowhere to sit, we, we <laughs> saw them all standing <laughs> in the <laughs> corridor during voting of age limit. They even had nowhere. Actually, when they all show up, no, they no. have yes, nowhere they to sit. Yes, they had nowhere even to stand. They sit on uh, each other's laps and all of that. Uh, that's a bit drastic. And uh, the reason I, I would say that is because uh, you do remember during the Brexit vote and the House of Commons in the UK, when all the members had to actually be on the floor to vote, mm. and they had nowhere to sit. So, so that wouldn't be the first case. That's no, the house but of does Commons. it create oh, so logic to so keep no, expanding? So, so, so no. help me understand, and no, I see people no. reason that way, that um, when a police officer in the U.S. shoots a civilian who is protesting, it is okay for that to happen. No, yeah. no, no that's, not, that's, that's not what I'm saying. That's not <laughs> what I'm saying. What I'm saying is uh, it, this is not the first country where if all the representatives... It doesn't matter. A, me, I'm looking country, at my country, Uganda. I'm looking in. at our small budget. Right. Do you know the comparison the between our economy and uh, uh, definitely, definitely the uh, UK economy? It's, it's, so it's, I'm looking at our small cake that we have, and they will keep, you know, breaking it up and all of that. It just does not make sense. Uh, so the UK can even afford, by the way, to to they have they one thousand legislators. They, 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 yes, <laughs> they they have the money to do that. We 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 here don't we don't we don't we don't. So if, and pragmatic. if you look even at the new districts being created, we have districts which wait for schools to close in order to rent space <laughs> for their <laughs> meetings. You know, Kenya reached a level where there was the same pace of gerrymandering under President Moi, and the parliament of Kenya moved to create a criteria for creation of any new administrative unit. First of all, they tagged it to the number of population. What is the size of population that needs a new district in order for the argument of services to make sense? They also created <coughs> a criteria on the income of that area that needs mm -hmm. a new district. Do they have capacity to sustain the district through their local revenue? And then, of course, the availability of infrastructure. We have districts which sit under trees. We mm. have districts which 
you know? And then you go on every day. The, the preoccupation, by the way, this parliament, the, main, the major business they do is one, approve of loans, and we all know our debt burden, even if you used the current annual budget this year to pay debts, for the, our foreign debt, you would not cover it. They approve loans, they, they, they approve supplementary budgets, and they create administrative units. This has been the major business of the 10th parliament, and it's a shame. It's, it's a great uh, shame. Uh, okay, that, that would be a, a topic for another day, uh, Sarah. Uh, Joe, let's uh, head over to um, yesterday's news uh, 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 for... I think before we head over to uh, uh, Salong, Elias Lukwago, uh, I think it would make sense for us to talk about talk of coalitions earlier on, a few months before. And the political parties actually coming to the, uh, to the fore and making it very clear that, you know, there might not be a coalition per se. Um, I'm sure you've talked about this particular topic countless times. But uh, at a time like this, when <coughs> you've had a, uh, an incumbent for over 30 years, isn't it vital for all of you to come to the table and just, you know, map out a plan at a time like this? If you want it that bad, wouldn't it be critical for you to just address this as, a co as all of you on the table, if you really want it that bad? I, I think for a very long time, Ugandans have been saying, you know, people that are aspiring for change, the United Forces of Change, we like to call them, please get together. Because when you get together, you are putting together abilities, you're putting together different experiences, you're putting together resources, human resources and otherwise. There's a lot that you, you get to put together. It becomes a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Ugandan said that in 2006, there was an attempt to unite the opposition. It fell through the roof. In 2011, there was yet another attempt, IPC, Interparty Corporation. Yeah. That did not work. Many people were disappointed. 2016, there was yet another attempt, TDA, the Democratic Alliance. It did not work, and uh, many hearts were broken. Do we fail to keep trying? I don't think so. So the people were saying, but this thing never works. Why are you even attempting? And you're saying, you keep trying, especially if you know that it's the right thing to do. And so we, we have been having engagements. With Maybe the opposition colleagues. doesn't want it that bad. Because if you're to look at uh, Kenya, the Jubilee, the alliances, they do all these alliances on the mm -hmm. eve of elections, you know, because, you know, they have a plan mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. want it bad. And it, you, you find a way to make it work. I think for me the most important thing is that Ugandans want it real bad. So we the leaders, if I'm to use that very humbly by the way, we, we, we need to get to that realization and know that the people that we are aspiring to lead, they want this to happen. And um, so I'll tell you, behind the scenes there's, there's lots of engagements that are going on. Uh, for starters, we have dealt with what I'll call level one. Level one is that all of us agree we need to work together. We have had engagements with, with everybody. Dr. BCJ, General Mugisha Muntu, Honorable Mao, um, Honorable Vasalirwa, and a plethora of others. And all of us are in unison about the fact that we ought to do this together. Now, what we are trying to address is the how, how that working together gets to happen, the modus operandi, what it gets to look like in reality. And, and that's the real heavy lifting. <laughs> It's the real heavy lifting. Um, it takes a bit of time. I'm cognizant of the fact that we have run out of time, but let's see how we salvage the remaining time. Because it's important that we, we do that, that we, you know, marshal resources and abilities. I know there are some people who will say that uh, maybe strategy-wise, it would be good that you have maybe two candidates or that kind of thing, and then deny mm, Mr. Museveni mm. 50% plus um, one. I don't know about uh, that. Uh, Sarah, you, you could come in here. Because, uh, again, Joel, I appreciate where you're coming from. And uh, maybe... Uh, we need to understand that uh, a, a, a sort of a, a coalition of sorts doesn't necessarily mean a, a sole candidate, no. So I like that you've started at the beginning, which is level one, which is, you know, uh, how about we meet at the table and then we talk. So it's, it's, it's very uh, fundamental that uh, we are cognizant of the fact that it doesn't necessarily equate to having a sole candidate. Well, that's the, act, that's, that's, that's the last bit that I talked about, mm -hmm. that there are pundits who will say that you know, perhaps you can agree to say, let's field this number of candidates to deny the incumbent 50% plus one. Right. I, right. I don't know if that would work, but uh, the idea is that we get to talk and agree mm. on how we are going to move, um, which, which we are doing. 
behind the scenes. It's, it's not easy. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that it's all glossy <laughs> and uh, an easy ride. It's, it's not because people have vested interests. That's usually the challenge, by the way. Yeah. People have vested interests. Each yeah. of them has supporters telling them, you are the man or you are the woman. You know, uh, if you dare give it to the other, we are going to come and yeah. pick you out of that room like happened in 2016. So it's, it's really heavy lifting. It's tough stuff, but uh, we, we've got to keep doing it. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah, what do you say to that? Because uh, 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 well, it, it, it takes leadership to to want to serve the country beyond your selfish interests, uh, and this is the challenge of the, of the opposition. Citizens are watching. I know on several occasions, even when we are doing the campaign for free and fair elections, the message of the citizens has always been clear. They want a united opposition. That's those who are interested in change. But also the political context within which the, the parties operate is, is very problematic. If you look at the nature of our civil and political rights in this country, I mean, I, I, I give credit, you know, hats off for, for the people that who hold out there in these parties. It's really tough. You're faced with a whole state apparatus that is aimed at failing you and tramping on your political rights on every other day that the state institutions do, the police, the army. They, they don't, they, their main focus is to curtail opposition in this country and, and political dissent. So that's the tall order or the elephant that the opposition leaders are faced with. The other challenge is ability to, to sustain parties and direct the course of parties by the citizens that belong in them. If you look at the party bo bases in, in this country, you have citizens who are impoverished in, in parties. Uh, the recent Bureau of Statistics report indicated that poverty levels in this country are increasing, and, and, and the most hit districts are Eastern and Northern Uganda. So you have citizens that have no capacity to sustain political activities through funding, through contribution to parties, through active citizenry to command the direction of, of, of activities in these parties. So mainly citizens' membership is like token. <coughs> I, I think <coughs> NAP has said that your cards are 1,000 mm. shillings. Oh, wha what is 1,000 going to do? Parties are supposed to raise primary resources from their members. But also, if you make it more than 1,000, who is going to afford it? That's the challenge. Yes, <laughs> because you look at COVID, people don't have money. Mm. But na naturally, the, 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 the survival rates for citizens, engaging in politics is a luxury. Even when we are discussing here, people look at us as, as you know, we, we are part of the people enjoying the luxury of the elite mm -hmm. and maybe people who are assumed to be a bit comfortable economically. Because if you have somebody who is not sure about lunch today, I don't think they can sit here and discuss the issues we are discussing. So that's the challenge, the, 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 the tall order that parties are faced with. Uh, uh, if, if uh, I wanted to come to the coalition bit. Yes. So given that background, what is the nature of parties that should then have a force or citizens who want unity of opposition do they have a force to command and direct their leaders to put away their selfish interests and work for the common good of, of their members? The members of parties don't have that, uh, sir. that clout. So, so, so then, no, then no, no, let me conclude uh, no, the just one, one minute. Mm. So the, whether the opposition should unite or not is now at the mercy of, of the leadership. But I'm calling upon these leaders to put country before so to listen to the people that subscribe to their parties and do what is best for this country. You've, you've mentioned uh, something that's quite interesting, which is uh, the, the financing of the parties. Yes. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's another elephant in the room because uh, one party could have some uh, a well of uh, fina financing and another is looking to raise money through uh, the, 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 the members yeah. and subscription. Uh, you have a one Stella Nyanzi, Dr. Stella Nyanzi, who's saying, you know what, uh, just give me whatever you can, you know, as, as, as my people. You know, she's also just going for the same model of sorts. And that leaves me wondering how critical it is <coughs> for us to maybe have a level playing field because it has to start with the financing 
through having a level playing field, you can cut down on the discrepancies when it comes to one party <coughs> having a, you know, a well of, of finances and another maybe not having that much. I don't want to bring in the U.S. example, which has uh, been a democracy for over 200 years, but, but would that be something that then creates a, a bit of a level playing field, Joe? So you talk about finances, and um, for a very long time, I don't know if they rectified that, for a very long time, NRM was notorious for not filing returns with the Electoral Commission. Every party is meant to do that, and your returns. And by that, you're filing your income, where it is coming from, and how you are spending it, you know. So they are not doing this. I, I, I hope that, I wish, you know, there was somebody from the NRM to dispute or otherwise. But, but for a very long time, that was the case. And, and the reason that was so is because they have access to state money. They use it in a manner so wanton. Um, but also membership in NRM is free. There, yeah, there you are. are free. Um, you know, in 2011, <laughs> these people literally raided Bank of Uganda. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I remember <laughs> Professor Emmanuel Tumusime Mtevidi coming out, a very, very <laughs> bland, honest man, and he said, I was used yeah. to fund the election. <laughs> he said that. Um, but, but the point really is, it's, it's, it's tough. As we were talking about our cards being 1,000 shillings, you know, so the people who are telling us, no, that's too little, make it 5,000, make it 10,000, so that you can raise money, because we need money for the upcoming campaign. A running a campaign, especially a presidential campaign, is such a tall order. It takes a huge toll on you financially. But then we're also being realistic. You know, we want this party to be a party for Mutu Wawansi. Boda Boda has not been working until yesterday. So they, they don't have money, and yet they want to acquire membership. So if you put it at an exorbitant fee, they're not going to have access to this. So it's a catch-22. Uh, but, but hopefully, hopefully we can find ingenious ways to, to raise these monies, to do the work that needs to be done. Because ultimately, work has got to be done. It requires money, plenty of it. And uh, not everybody has access to state resources like the NRM. Mm. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm going to just come back to you. Uh, there's the issue of uh, sole candidate, uh, candidature of sorts uh, when it comes to the top job uh, for the presidential aspirants. Uh, we've seen it at the NRM. Uh, we've seen it in very many other parties. Uh, um, uh, uh, well, Honorable Chagula, you know, exception. Uh, I'm, I'm very convinced no one actually came to uh, 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 try and uh, have the top job uh, uh, vying for it at least. Uh, is this something that's synonymous with uh, the parties in the country? Sarah? Generally, some parties are faced with challenges of internal democracy. Maybe I'll start with the, the party in power, the, the NRM. I think after the challenge posed by the former prime minister, because before, before Amama Mbavas came up, we saw stage-managed elections at, at one time with Beta Akech running with President Museveni and another time with, a, with another MP. So we have had two challenges for the presidential flag bearer in NRM, but largely stage-managed. So when Mbavas showed interest in the, in the top job within the party, then the famous Chankwanzu resolution was, was moved and signed for the sole candidature. I know John, John Simba, that is his name, the mm. former MP from Maki, they expressed interest in, in, in challenging President Museven for the NRM flag bearer. But when he returned forms, <laughs> his forms were rejected, and, and I wish Tango Doi was here to, to, to explain. He has gone to court to challenge uh, I'm sure violation of his rights at that level. So maybe NRM would not have had a sole candidate this time round. But Johnny Simba wa was stopped from returning his forms, yet he was allowed to speak and fulfill and pay the money. Then when he brought his forms, and we don't want your forms. So at that level, it is problematic. I, I know General Muntu has been endorsed. Also, you, you could so. call him a sole candidate. candidate. Uh, same for, for, for Chagrani, and then we have FDC struggling and even extending time to, to try to identify a flag bearer. It is, it is a bit disturbing in the, in the advancement of, of multi-party dispensation in this country. This is the fourth election under multi-party politics within the context of the 1995 constitution as, as amended. It is disturbing. It does not show growth internal growth within parties. And if I was to make a comparison with 
parties like Chama Chama Pinduzi in Tanzania, there's clear succession of who is the next lead. I know there are challenges with Magufuli who has really come up and violated all the, the fundamental rights and freedoms in Tanzania. But you could see a clear succession trend mm. within <coughs> CCM and with internal democracy, with the ability to allow internal competition, save for the time when President Chikwete was asked to step down for Mukapa because he had defeated Mukapa in that election. But still there was negotiation at that level. So I wish to see Ugandan parties nurturing, deliberately nurturing leaders and successors within their internal parties. Joel, uh, she's raised some, uh, raised some in interesting points. You know, it has to start with you actually in the party and on the inside before we actually uh, morph this forward. Um, th this is maybe a disease that uh, we are seeing on your side too. You see, the important thing really is um, open up the process, okay? Open up the process. Let no one come and pick, but uh, open up the process. Don't lock out anybody. I think for me that's the critical thing. Yes. Especially yes. if you're saying you're still very popular. So why, why are you afraid of, of <laughs> people getting into the race, you know? Uh, and for me that's the important thing. That's what we're doing on our end. You know, you've got to open up the process. Let, let no one else come and say I'm going to buy for that position after all. It's obvious this person is going to beat me. But let the process be open, you know. So what's, what's happening to our colleagues? In the NRM, I uh, will see more. It's, it's, it's very disturbing because if you're Mr. Museveni and you're saying, you know, this is just a Simwa, he's even a former MP, he's not even a sitting MP, so you're saying he's going to be easy for you to defeat, then let him be, <laughs> you know. So, so, so that's the challenge, really. Um, so it is very easy for the process to be opened up and then no one else but that one whom everybody is seeing uh, gets to pick forms, which is fine. But as long as the process is opened up, otherwise then... Did anyone pick forms you, on your side? You clog the system. So we have been a movement. We just metamorphosed into yeah, a political yeah, party. Yeah, yeah. We had the delegates conference. I know people have been asking, uh, eh, where did that delegates conference happen? And how come there was no noise about it? <laughs> uh, we, we have a, a bit of clever, <laughs> as, as the youth say. Uh, that delegates conference was uh, advertised in the newspapers. If you look for... You guys have a library here. If you go for... Uh, July 1st, New Vision, check page 33. You will see the advert there. Police was written to, they stamped, said no problem because they thought this is just another of those little parties and, and so on. And, and so processes kept moving and there's others that are coming up. But the bottom line, um, Arnold, is uh, you, you want to begin to nurture that. And for a young entity like us, you know, at, at least in the sense of new leadership, We've got to be very careful in that quest that uh, you don't try and, and frustrate anybody. Especially because you're saying maybe it would be a lot easier for this one to win. So if anybody else expresses interest, please don't lock them out. That, that's the principle yes. that should be followed. Yeah. Uh, a question that uh, uh, has been asked uh, to, uh, to several other presidents, well, vying presidents, uh, I think being the spokesperson of your party, uh, you could address this. Um, come 2021, if uh, uh, the NUP were to lose the election, would you accept the result? <laughs> what kind of question is that? <laughs> <laughs> Let's first organize a, a free and fair election. <laughs> no, no, Before no. you ask about if you're to lose, because for me, the most important thing is what kind of election. You see, the Kenyan Supreme Court, um, in a um, very monumental decision, did say that an election is not an event. It is a process. And by the way, we actually have similar precedent here. I'm sure yes. Sarah might remember as a lawyer. There was a case of Winnie Vyanyima versus Ngoma uh, So court said the same thing. An election is not an event. It doesn't happen just on election day. It's a process. It begins with things like consultation, which are provided for within a consultation. I mean, some said you're not going to go and consult. You're not going to go and meet people. There was no COVID at the time, meanwhile. You know, if it happened now, that yeah. would be the excuse. But see, no, and, and that's part of the process. So you're making it unfair. Because if the law allows for someone who is interested in running for president to go and consult people, why not open it up? You know, and then campaigns. And here they are telling us about scientific campaigns, which are not envisaged by our country's constitution. When you read uh, a plethora of them, beginning with Article 61, it envisages a free and fair election, a participatory election. Then you come up and say, no, we are not going to do it this way. Meanwhile, the very people who are signing all these regulations, you know, uh, Dr. Jaina Cheng saying uh, 
uh, these regulations must be put in place. Professor Ephraim Kamutu, Minister of Justice and Constitutional Affairs, who signed that statutory instrument, the very, very people are the ones that went out there and, and broke the rules because practically on ground it does not work. So my point is that entire process should be free and fair, should the ground should be leveled, and then you can talk about... That's when you can ask questions like, so if you lose, will you concede defeat? No, and we must make sure uh, we have a free that, 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 and fair election. And uh, with the precedents that you are mm. uh, putting forth in uh, mm. what you just said, with that precedence, if, it were, if the status quo was to stay the way it is right now, would it be free and fair in your view? Already it isn't, because like I'm saying, the election has started. It's a process. It's not an event. We are not waiting for election day and say, this is the election. No, the election process is on, and there are already challenges, and that's why we are up against them. We are saying no to a number of these things. We are saying no to the whole idea of scientific election. Now, are we oblivious to COVID-19 and all of that? Well, I would, uh, one of our ghetto people is telling me, uh, uh this COVID thing doesn't exist. I said, what do you mean? People are dying, you know, at least in other countries. And the fellow said, no, a doctor for you. Are you a doctor? The person asked me. <laughs> I said, sir, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> and he said, now a doctor, Dr. Jane Ruther Cheng, you know, went out there without masks and so on. So if the very doctor who signed these regulations, who is a medical doctor, shows us that this thing doesn't exist. And it's unfortunate, by the way, that we are sending that message to people out there. Mm. Because you're not going to sit on TV and tell them, don't send the data. But then when you go out there, you're practicing a different thing altogether. Realistically, for them, they're thinking, no, you're taking them for a ride. So it's, it's an entire process that should be handled the right way. Sarah, your last words on the idea of a process and how it's uh, faring so far? Yeah, uh, yeah, like Joel has stated, our electoral laws, all of them provide for campaign meetings. I know that under Article 50 of the Electoral Commission Act, they, they, they pro there is a provision that the Electoral Commission can adapt some of the laws, but being mindful of constitutional provisions in line with the provisions of the constitution. That's how section 50 expressive is, express in express means states. So when the electoral commission announced the revised roadmap, they said they had changed uh, electoral uh, rules to, to outlaw public gatherings because they have a mandate to do so. But if you look at Article 29 of the Constitution, I know there is Article 22 on the right to life, but Article 29 on freedom of movement, freedom of association, expression, and, and speech. Mm. So the question is, did Electoral Commission adapt electoral laws in accordance with the Constitution? Mm. I don't think so. Also, there's a provision, if normal life is not enabled in the country, why are we not under state of emergency? I want to use an example. There's a one candidate in Zimbabwe North called Aine Kabuta. I don't know whether he has any relations with the president. He held a massive rally of about 5,000 people. The nobody has a mask. There is no social distancing. There is no observation of COVID guidelines. And I'm sure there is police in Zimbabwe. No. Uh, so uh, we have selective application. We have selective implementation of guidelines against opposition members when NRM members are freely campaigning, including the political supervisor of the Electoral Commission, Professor Kamunt, who has held a series of meetings in uh, his constituencies uh, in violation of the revised roadmap, in a violation of presidential guidelines against COVID. Sir, uh, we condemn to, such practice. Uh, first of all, we need to uh, uh, put this clear that uh, we have not substantiated that particular rally as uh, NTV. Uh, yes, no, no, that, that, that yeah. is my, pers no, my no, person. I have mean, seen okay, anyway, those that no, have been substantiated. Uh, 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 Dr. Yes. Jenuta Cheng was in Lira. That one, that one, that one. Professor we Ephraim Kamundu campaigned in church, had a rally in church. And several right. and, uh, <laughs> had So this is Patani guys, you cannot come yeah. to church to pray so yeah. that they can use the churches as rallies. Those have happened. Yeah. Banana Mugwanya is the woman MP for Movende. She's also the Minister of State for Kampala. She had rallies in uh, many parts of Mubeni, yes, yes. none of them with masks, uh, so that is all out there. Joel, all I'm saying is uh, some the of these the have way. not been substantiated right. yes, by us. Yes, but I, so I have seen that video. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, in fact, you can share the video with us. We'll I be, will, I will we'll share it. We'll be the first ones Some to actually those that have talked yes. about. Uh, those ones definitely, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she, she did have a, she said she, she only took off the mask at the moment. So, oh, uh, come so on. it's, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> lady and the gentleman, let's leave it there, let's leave it there. Extreme left, uh, Joel Senyoni, uh, uh, 
uh, who's a spokesperson for uh, the NUP, and uh, to my left, uh, Sarah Bureta, who's a political analyst. Uh, many thanks for making time to speak to us, and uh, let's take a quick break. We'll be back with more on Morning at NTP after this.